Great. Thanks a lot. It's, it's great to be, to be here today. So uh, I, uh, I've been banging around the industry for a little while. Bob Mugley, I'm CEO of Snowflake. I was uh, the first technical guy on SQL Server back in 1988 and then spent 23 years, I guess that's an interesting number here. Um, I spent 23 years at Microsoft where ultimately I ran the server and tools group. And a year ago I, d I decided to join Snowflake to help reinvent the data warehouse for the cloud. And what I wanted to talk about today was, was, was the cloud and data warehousing and, and basically ask the question, can the cloud um, solve, solve my data warehousing challenges? Um, so my, the first question at very high level, what exactly is a cloud? An, you know, we hear a lot about the cloud. Um, very simply, according to Gartner, a cloud is a style of computing in which scalable and elastic IT enabled capabilities are delivered as a service using internet technologies. I'll just put a little focus on, on the words scalable, elastic, and service because I think those are the sort of key, uh, key attributes that differentiate a cloud from an on-premises or a traditional data center environment. So one of the first questions someone might ask when they think about a cloud is, should I consider a private cloud or a public cloud? And while that's an interesting question to ask, and a lot of people are looking at private clouds and how they can implement them, the reality for almost every company and everybody is, is that the public cloud is the only viable answer for most companies. Companies are struggling with building private clouds. A lot of companies are trying to build them. Very, very few companies have successfully deployed private clouds at any level of scale that would allow you to take on a task, a major task within the company, like data warehousing. So for the majority of folks, public is the only real answer. And while there are a lot of concerns that some have, many viable and reasonable concerns about that, there's a lot of significant things that people are doing today with public clouds. Companies like the New York Times, NASDAQ, Condé Nast, all have had successful projects rolling out public cloud environments. And we see a great deal of openness um, in more and more organizations. Scott mentioned, interestingly, how the, the federal government and local governments are adopting, adopting public clouds. We see many companies, pharmaceuticals, financial services industries, lots of companies looking at the public cloud as a viable answer to solve their problems. Now, one of the questions one might think about is, is what are the models that exist within the cloud and then specifically how does that apply to data warehousing? There, there really are sort of three models that, that one can think of. And again, this source is Gartner. The idea of uh, infrastructure as a service, a platform as a service, and software as a service are, are terms that have been described for quite some time. Gartner describes this as infrastructure as a service as being the combination of the automation of compute plus storage of networking. That's infrastructure. Platform is the application infrastructure or the middleware that allows you to build applications. And software as a service is really a full software as a service provided by a vendor. Now, taking that and really applying it and thinking about it in the context of data warehousing, how does this apply to data warehousing? You know, at the, at the foundation, you can think of, of on-premises as being, as being the standard that people have been using, the traditional environments that people have been using for many, many decades. And if we split this into three different areas, the, the, the data center and hardware environment, the software, the, the, the database software that runs, and then the management, the DBA function that sits on top of that. Um, if you think about infrastructure as a service, and of which Amazon's core, AWS is an example, Azure is another example. Infrastructure as a service really takes away the data center and the, the hardware, but it leaves the task of running the database and choosing the database to the person implementing the cloud. An example of this would be running Oracle or MySQL um, in your own virtual machine on AWS or Amazon or Google. Um, but that would be an example of infrastructure as a service. Platform as a service takes this a step beyond that by providing a database, a database that's pre-configured and pre-installed for you. And here, probably the, the, the examples that many people think about, at least with regards to data warehousing and, and the big data space, are things like Amazon's Redshift or Elastic MacReduce or EMR. Those are both examples of 
platform as a service offerings. They take, they, they enable the infra, they deploy the database for you, but you're still responsible for managing the overall environment. It still really requires the administrative functions that are traditionally required of a data warehouse. And then the, the final example, software as a service, takes away all of those things. All of the capabilities are provided by the vendor to you. And Snowflake is a good example of a data warehouse as a service, where we take, it, we take, it, take care of all of that for you. you with Snowflake, we, you don't need an account on Amazon. You can have one, and we can pull data from it. But if you don't have one, we can run the entire application, the entire database for you, the entire data warehouse for you. And we're responsible for, for the tuning and the maintenance of that. Now, one of the questions um, that people think about often is the scale and how can the cloud help me to scale to meet the needs of the data that I have. And one of the interesting opportunities that the cloud enables is a very different fundamental architecture in the way the system can be designed. The cloud is fundamentally different in that it really does automate all of the functions associated with storage and compute and networking. And it provides, as an intrinsic set of capabilities, the ability to store huge amounts of data very reliably in blobs and, and then have the compute be separate from that. Now, a traditional data warehouse, which has been around for a long time, is built typically as a shared nothing cluster with a set of nodes that are connected together and the data is tightly coupled to the nodes. And in fact, we've talked, the industry has talked for, for years and years about moving compute to where the data is. Well, the cloud changes that equation fundamentally. And because of the nature of the cloud, it makes it possible to split the data apart from the compute and treat, treat both of them as fully separate elastic resources that can scale to meet the needs. And this is what we've done with Snowflake. Our primary data store with Snowflake is S3, which provides an incredible degree of scalability and durability, 11 nines of durability. And yet we separate all the compute from that, running that as a set of what we call a virtual warehouse, which is a set of Amazon EC2 nodes um, that can be instantiated on demand. And those can scale to any level. You can have multiple virtual warehouses instantiated at the same time, and they can be of different sizes. In fact, it's possible to change the size dynamically on the fly based on the kinds of queries you're running. And none of that is possible with a traditional data warehouse running on premises, or even a traditional data warehouse like Redshift running within, within a, a, a cloud environment. Those all have tight couplings between the data and the compute. But by rethinking this and taking a very different approach, taking an approach that's fundamentally only possible with the cloud, you can achieve an unprecedented degree of elasticity and scalability, both of which are core definitions of what the cloud is really all about. So one of the questions that comes up a lot with the cloud is machine generated data. And this is important because the cloud itself is a creator of machine generated data. Traditionally, we've seen, we've seen really structured data that's been used in data warehouses. And I tend to think of this as data that is generated from business transactions. And it creates a highly structured environment, a tabular environment that is typically managed and, and, and dealt with in a relational way. Um, Semi-structured data is different. It's generated from machines or things like sensors. It is hierarchical in its nature. Um, typically, it's in a format like JSON or Avro, and it does not have a fixed schema. Now, the interesting thing is that traditional data warehouses do a very poor job of working with semi-structured data, and yet it's incredibly important. It's an incredible source of, of information about what's happening within an organization if that organization is generating, is, is, is operating in one of these cloud environments or is working with sensor data. What we've tried to do with Snowflake here is by inventing a data warehouse in the cloud era where semi-structured data is a very important part of the kind of data that people want to analyze, we've enabled our system to work very seamlessly with that semi-structured data. In fact, we allow full relational operations against that semi-structured data. You can do a join between a column in a standard relation in a standard structure table and, and, and data that is hierarchically stored um, in a semi-structured format. And we process that very efficiently efficient 
efficiently because we do columnar storage of that semi-structured data and our query optimizer knows how to prune it to be able to get the most efficient possible queries. So this is a very real world thing that, that companies are dealing with today. They struggle a lot with it in trying to figure out how to handle it. But what we've done is focus on reinventing that and making it much more straightforward to issue a relational query, a SQL query against it. So one of the questions that keeps coming up, I mean, this, this comes up time and time again, as companies have real world concerns about the security in the cloud environment. Is the cloud secure? And can I trust the cloud um, with my most important business data? Um, that's particularly true for public clouds, although I think it, 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 it's equally true. It's something people need to think about for their own data centers as well. So when you think about data security, I think you have to start kind of with the fundamentals. I mean, one of the things that's been very clear about the, with the breaches that we've seen over the last couple of years is whether the data is in the cloud or in an on-premises data center, if the fundamentals aren't managed properly, the data can be lost to very extreme consequences. Um, and, and, and so some of the fundamentals there are thinking about the authentication. Uh, username and password is, is not a good way to authenticate, uh, authenticate a user because of the ability for that, that password to be lost and somebody in a remote location being able to, to access the credentials. So doing things like two-factor authentication. Data encryption is incredibly important. Um, m most of the data that is stored in the world today is stored in an unencrypted form. And what that means, it is essentially always one ACL away from being lost. Um, if you encrypt it, it makes it much more difficult for, for, for a, mal a malintended user to actually use the data effectively because they have to get the data and then they have to break the key store and then go through the process of decrypting it. Um, so that's important. Access control to determine um, the, the minimal privileges that people have to allow people to have only access to the data they need within the organization helps. And then, of course, there's a great deal of process and procedure and then as appropriate certifications to validate that, in fact, those things are being formed. All of these things, I think, are particularly critical. Um, they're critical everywhere, but they are particularly critical in a cloud environment where companies are essentially entrusting a vendor to work with their data. So there's some things that sort of sit on top of that that are, are specific and focused only really in a cloud environment. Um, one of the things that's fantastic about a cloud environment is if you're running an online service, a software as a service offering like Snowflake, we have the ability to keep the software always up to date. What that means is that if we find something wrong where there's a potential security vulnerability in our code, we fix it that afternoon. I mean, literally, we find, that we find the problem, we validate it, and we fix it and roll it out the same day as it's found. So the, the window of vulnerability is dramatically reduced. One of the things that you can do, and I'll talk a little bit about how you can do this in, in the next set of slides, is you can also enable online upgrades so those upgrades can be deployed on a seamless basis without impacting the production use of customers. And that's pretty much unheard of in an on-premises uh, data, database environment. Uh, one of the things the cloud is incredibly good at, and if you focus on this, is that it can be a, a great source of logging information and auditing services and, um, and that can help to detect if there are any things going on within the system that need to be addressed. So security is one of those incredibly valid and, and significant concerns that people have about cloud data warehousing. Yet I would argue that it is possible to do a better job of securing information in the cloud than certainly 99% of all companies do with their on-premises systems. And, and it's just a, it's really a matter of focus and, and, and energy applied to it. A question that people ask about the cloud, is the cloud reliable? Can it be as reliable as my on-premises systems? And the answer is that it can be more reliable if the system is designed with a high availability in mind. One of the fundamental differences between a true cloud architecture and a traditional architecture is a traditional architect architecture is hardened against failures. You, things, you see things like failover nodes because people work so hard to avoid a failure, they, want to, they, want to, they, they, they put tremendous energy into that. In the cloud, there is an expectation that things will fail and the software is just designed to handle that in a seamless way. And what we've done literally with the Snowflake architecture is we've taken advantage of what the cloud can provide. First of all, a, tr a typical thing about the cloud is that, is that you can have 
multiple availability zones that are, high, that, are, that are all fully separate from an internet connection perspective and a power perspective, and yet are highly interconnected with very, very low latency links. In the case of, of where we are, Amazon Oregon, there are three availability zones and we run across all of them. The data is actually replicated. The core data is actually replicated using S3 across all of the availability zones and has this incredible 11 nines of durability associated with it. And then we will instantiate these virtual warehouses within an availability zone. But then sitting on top of that is a multi-tenant layer of software that actually spans across all of the availability zones and multiple nodes. So that if one of those nodes goes down, nothing happens. If an availability zone goes down, the jobs that are running in that availability zone obviously have to, have to stop running. But immediately, the other availability zones pick up that work and restart the queries that are in process. So the level of disruption is, is, is incredibly minimal, even in the case where an entire data center is lost, which is a, a very, very rare event. More likely, it's a small hiccup and in in one or two machines goes down, and the system continues to run with no disruptions associated with the user. The other thing about this architecture it is the fundamental thing that allows us to do the online upgrade that I described a minute ago. So fundamentally, the cloud can actually, if you architect for it, as we've done with Snowflake, it can actually be a higher availability environment. And you think about this availability of having data stretched across multiple, multiple data centers as something that's incredibly expensive that you pay a lot of money for. In the case of our architecture, it just falls out as a natural attribute of what we do. So one of the obvious questions people ask is, can I save money using the cloud? And the, you know, the answer to that is an unequivocal yes. Uh, traditional answers are very expensive. The cloud provides a very cross-effective solution for most customers. A typical deployment of Snowflake will be able to save a, a company considerable money relative to their, uh, their traditional on-premises systems. And we're even, you know, we're even super competitive. We even actually found ourselves to be more price performant than other cloud solutions like Redshift. So there's, there's no question that, that a cloud deployment can save you money, both in terms of absolute costs that you're spending on the software and hardware, but also on people costs associated with building the application. So it's a, it's a great answer. You know, and then the final question I'll just throw out there is, 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 is sh you know, should I use the cloud for my data warehouse? You know, and the answer there really is, is it, it, it just depends on where you and your company is in the life cycle of, of adapting to the cloud. I'm pretty confident that over a period of time, most companies will begin to use public clouds for a significant part of what they do, and the data warehouse will be an important part of that. And what we found is that when people do that, when they actually use, um, use Snowflake, they have some incredible results. The ability to load data and operate queries with no performance degradation. Queries that respond orders of magnitude faster than, than the alternative solution. And the possibility to, to work you know, to have, have, have end users work with magnitudes of data, amounts and volumes of data that were simply unfathomable on, with the traditional data warehousing offerings. So the potential is, is quite significant. And, you know, what I would just sort of say is I think it's worth a try. You know, if you're in the, if you're in the mode of thinking about what you want to do with your data warehouse, I think it's, it's, it's a good time to think about how the cloud can, could perhaps solve some of your problems. And, you know, we certainly love to talk to you at Snowflake. Thank you very much. Thank you. This really reminds me, it's, it's funny, right, because we've all uh, been talking about the cloud for the last, what, 10 years, and like this presentation just uh, reminds me or highlights the fact that we're still so early in that curve, right? We are. Like, still those uh, key questions around security, reliability, and all those things. Um, but uh, yeah, wanted to open two questions, one over there. Atul Chabra from Data Vani. Uh, the question is, traditionally in large enterprises, large companies, uh, uh, you, you want to keep the data warehouse in close proximity to the source systems because it's just enormous amounts of data being uh, yep. constantly fed into the data warehouses. How do you address that problem? Because uh, running in AWS, you have access to ample compute sure. and storage resources, but it, networking still costs you significantly, right? It it does cost you, but the cost is much, much less than it used to be. I mean, I think that if you went back five or certainly 10 years, 
ago, that problem was a really acute problem for companies. But now we even find that if people have initial data loads that are, you know, 50 or 100 terabytes of data load that they load into Snowflake, they can get that data up in a few week period. And it's, in, and it's almost certain that the daily amount of data that they generate is easily within the capacity of their, their typical links and it's not a significant problem. I think the networks have just gotten faster and it's not nearly as big a problem as it used to be. Okay, sorry, I have a second part to my question very quickly, unrelated quickly. to question. Quickly. Uh, data warehouse that you described here is collecting data in one place. How about analytics tools that make the data warehouse sure. useful. So the other side of it is the is the BI side of it and one of the key things about any data warehouse is working with a wide variety of tools that are out there. Um, Tableau and and, and, and 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 business objects and Looker and all of the many tools that are out there, Excel for that matter. And one of the key things that we do, we're a Snowflake is a traditional in the sense it is a SQL data warehouse. It's non-traditional in its architecture, but it is pure SQL in what we do. We support the full SQL standard, and we work with all of the tools that are that people are familiar with using. Great. Um, can I can possibly run to? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tony Bear with Ovum. Uh, Bob, uh, good talk. Um, and I'm very impressed with your technology. On the other hand, right now, as we were talking about, you know, before the session, there, you know, a lot of these innovations you're starting to see across the board, whether it be columnar, whether it be in memory, whether it be data mm -hmm. skipping, and also the market seems to be getting, you know, pretty crowded. I'm here. I'm, I'm getting a number of uh, of of of, um, of queries from new startups that are basically saying we're going to do data warehousing in the cloud. So how do you prevail you know, with, in what's probably a pretty noisy market right now, and especially when you have this 16-ton you know, gorilla called Redshift? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, what I'll say is the architecture that we've built, that where we separate the data from the compute the way we've done it, we think is pretty unique, and certainly in terms of having a product that is viable in the marketplace right now. There are perhaps are some startups that are behind us that are thinking of similar things, but honestly, we don't know of one that is nearly as far along as what we are. If you look at sort of our sort of, our sort of core value propositions, SaaS, um, this, this separation of compute and storage and the elasticity, um, the handling of semi-structured data in a fully relational way, and then the price performance. It turns out all of those are, are, are viable across the whole marketplace, including Redshift. I mean, there's no question that Redshift is the first cloud data warehouse that has been viable, and, and a number of people have adopted it, and certainly quite a few people are considering it. Um, but most of our, and virtually all of our customers have looked at Redshift, and quite a few of our customers have converted off of it because we're, we're very fundamentally different than they are. I mean, Redshift is fundamentally par Excel, uh, traditional data warehouse hosted within Amazon, and, and you know, we're a completely different design. We were designed for the cloud. Great. All right. Uh, well, one one more over here, I guess. Yeah, well, let's do those two, and then. Uh, you talk about separation, uh, computing, and data. But what you are doing with data? Do you have one source of data? Do you spread it yeah. between us? So what we do is, is the data, it's a great question, and I just didn't have a lot of time in the talk to go through the details of what we do. So what we do is the data is permanently stored in blob storage in S3. It's the only permanent store of the data. When you want to work with the data, you instantiate a virtual warehouse, um, which is essentially a set of, of EC2 compute nodes. When those nodes get instantiated, they have no data on them. Um, and what happens is, as you run queries, we dynamically pull the data over and, 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 and cache the data locally in the local flash on, the, on those nodes. So subsequent queries will run a little faster, but not all that much faster really because the way we're able to work with S3 is quite efficient. So the, the, we only pull the data over that we need to perform the query and we pull it over dynamically based on the query. There is no need to pre-populate the nodes with data. There's no concept of, 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 of separating the data or sharding the data across the nodes. We do that all dynamically. One last one over there. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, or maybe on a similar note, in terms of data transformation, uh, in cases where data is coming from multiple sources and needs right. to be warehoused, 
Um, it, do you need to transform it before you load it into Snowflake, or is uh, or you don't is it need to? Snowflake? You don't need to. Many customers have existing ETL processes that do that transformation, in which case they can just feed us with their data that's pre-structured in a star schema. But if you load the data into Snowflake in a raw form, you can also. We're actually very good at performing transform operations as well. The other thing that's very common is is that if people are working with semi-structured data, one of the things that we've seen quite a few customers do um, it, it before they get to Snowflake is they, they have the semi-structured data and they go through elaborate processes using Hadoop systems to try and transform it into a form that can be consumed by a relational data warehouse. You just don't need to do any of that with Snowflake. Just load the data in and, we, and, we, and you can query it directly. So we save companies an awful lot of time and effort in terms of data transformation in that case. Wonderful. Great. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot. For being Appreciate here. it. Thanks.